Good evening, my dear colleagues. Welcome to another Inged Zoom Serious Talk. Today, our guest is Associate Professor Dr. Gökhan Öztürk. Gökhan Hocam is currently working as an Associate Professor at Anadolu University, Faculty of Education, Department of Foreign Language Education. <coughs> Gökhan Hocam holds an MA and PhD in English Language Teaching from Middle East Technical University. His research, <coughs> I'm terribly sorry, his main research interests include second language teacher education, oral corrective feedback, effective factors in language learning and assessing language skills. <coughs> This evening, the title of his talk is How Conscious Are We While Correcting Our Errors in, errors in EFL Classrooms? Thank you, dear Gökhan Ucham, for being our guest speaker and welcome again. The screen is all yours. Aydan Ucham, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me for uh, such a fruitful session. And I am also, uh, this is a great pleasure for me to be with you in this Uh, training session and I hope it's gonna be very beneficial for you because I'm going to combine some research and practical knowledge in the in this session and I will try my best to increase your awareness in oral corrective feedback moves. Uh, Aydan Hocam has already mentioned about my bio statement and uh, I don't want to talk more about myself and I want to direct the start with my session. First of all, I would like to give some brief information about the flow of the session. First of all, I will briefly talk about my own journey as a teacher before and as a teacher trainer now on oral corrective feedback. And after that, I will turn on a kind of handout and will ask you to reflect on your own oral corrective feedback practices. And after that, we will focus on some theoretical knowledge about what is an error, what's a mistake, and what is oral corrective feedback. Then we will have a look at the types of oral corrective feedback in detail, and we will learn about the very important taxonomy of oral corrective feedback. And after that, I will mention about the effectiveness of those oral corrective feedback types And then I will again ask you to have a reflective eye on your own practices with the help of the handout. And after that, I will mention a little bit about our students' perspectives towards oral corrective feedback types. Yes, we are teachers. We know what to do. We have some ideas about our own moves. But what do our students think about our corrective feedback practices? And towards the end, again, you will reflect on your own practices and we will finish this session with some humble suggestions at the end. First of all, I would like to start with my own, I'm sorry, with my own journey about oral corrected feedback. I started my profession as a primary and secondary school teacher and I, uh, taught English to primary school students for about three years. And in those times, I believed that I was a good teacher. I had very good relationship with my students. I was okay with my classroom management skills, but in terms of the oral corrective feedback and in terms of providing feedback to my students' performances, I had zero consciousness. Yes, I was doing something, Of course, I was correcting my students' mistakes. And most of the time I was just providing the correct form and going on to my lesson, but I was not conscious about that. That was not a very, I mean, uh, conscious process for me. And that was the case for about three years. And then in 2010, I started working as an Okutman in English prep programs, and I started to teach young adults. My students, the profile of my students 
was different, but I was again, the same type of the teacher. I was correcting their mistakes, of course, but I had no idea what I was consciously doing in my classes. I was a good motivator for my students to help them speak and write in classroom atmosphere. I was encouraging my students very well to help them participate and utter a few words or sentences in classroom atmosphere. But while I was correcting my students' mistakes or errors, I mean, that was spontaneous with no scientific or theoretical background, okay? But in 2012, in a postgraduate course, which was on classroom research, that was the first time I learned about oral corrective feedback. And starting from that time, a long journey began for me in which I made a lot of research. I published some papers in international journals and more importantly, I improved myself as a reflective teacher. I had a critical eye on my own practices while providing corrective feedback to my students. And after that time, after I learned about oral corrective feedback and its taxonomies, I became more conscious about that topic. And I believe and I hope this session will help you experience the same development and consciousness. But first of all, I want you to have a reflective eye on your own practices. I hope you can share, see this Word document because we had some problems at the beginning of the session. There's a Word document on the screen. Can you see it now? Okay, very nice. There are six dialogues here. The dialogues are original data from my own studies. What I want you to do is that, please imagine yourself in your own classrooms. Think that you are teaching a grammar point or you are conducting a speaking session, it doesn't matter, okay? And imagine yourself giving feedback to your students and correcting your students' mistakes. The sentences you see here are real, but the remaining teacher's student turns are hypothetical. You don't have to feel all teacher students' moves, okay? Just think that you are in this situation and correct your students' errors, okay? I want you to take some notes, if possible, about those situations, because after that, we will talk about your corrective feedback moves again. We have about four or five minutes, okay? Please write your corrective feedback moves and how you can go on those dialogues by correcting your students. but try to be as realistic as possible, okay? Think about your own real practices in classroom, okay? What you write here should reflect what you already do in your classrooms.
be done or you need some extra minutes. Please do not forget to take some notes about your corrective feedback moves by continuing the dialogue because we will need them towards the end of the session. Okay, do we need any extra time? If you need, please write on the chat box. If you don't need any time, I will go on with the slides. Okay, no time, no extra time is needed. Okay. We will talk about them later, okay? Just keep your answers, all right? Okay. These, the things you have written so far will reflect your own real life practices and we will analyze them a few minutes later. But before that, we need to learn some theoretical aspects of oral corrective feedback. And first of all, of course, we need to know what we are correcting. Here, we have two important concepts, which are error and mistake. Although in the literature and among informal chatting among us, we use these two concepts interchangeably most of the time. But of course, theoretically, there are some slight differences between these two concepts, okay? Esma Jam, we will definitely get your ideas, okay? This will be the most enjoyable part. Errors are defined as the regular patterns in learner speech, which consistently differ from the target language model. Here, we have a target language model and anything, any linguistic item that differs from that target language model is called as the error. On the other hand, we have mistakes, which are called as some memory lapses or slips of tongues or other instances of performance errors. Mistakes are not fossilized, okay? They are usually called performance level. I don't know, Jam, you're definitely right, but errors are mostly related with the competence level. Yes, there is a big difference between these two theoretically. They refer to absolutely different things. However, as teachers, it is not very easy for us to differentiate between these two in a classroom atmosphere. We have 40 minutes. We have to keep up with the curriculum, okay? We need to refer to our students about everything in the classroom. We need to be alert about the dynamics of the classroom. So it's not something very easy to detect whether it is an error or it's a mistake. For that reason, any erroneous utterance we hear as teachers is a potential error in the eyes of us, okay? Because it's not very easy to identify whether it's a mistake or it's an error. For that reason, all of them are potential errors for teachers. The errors for that reason are significant for any stakeholder 
in the field of applied linguistics and language teaching. First of all, errors or mistakes, they are significant for the language teachers because with the help of those errors, we can observe our learners' progress in language learning. We can identify their strengths and weaknesses. We can identify the progress they have taken in the language learning process, okay? As teachers, we can observe our students' levels with the help of errors and mistakes. Secondly, errors are also important for language researchers because these errors and mistakes can provide some insights for how language is learned, what kind of mistakes are made by the students when students make mistakes in their developmental process. These are some important topics for language researchers and errors are very important for all those language researchers in applied linguistics. And finally, of course, errors are significant for learners as well, because learners, you remember, gets involved in output hypothesis, in hypothesis testing, okay? They try to utter and form advanced level sentences. They test their knowledge and they learn with the help of all those errors during the language learners process. And when we face such errors and mistakes in a classroom atmosphere, of course, there is a reaction we show. Any teacher show this reaction, okay? So this reaction to error is called corrective feedback. And when I was a teacher, um, that was just like a kind of, um, game saloon for me, okay? There are some games, when you go to a game saloon, there are some games in which some worms pops up and you have a hammer in your hand. And when they pop up, you kick them, you beat them, okay? And I was just like that type of a teacher. When I heard some uh, corrective uh, erroneous st statement, I tried to correct all the errors just like this, okay? So, in a way, corrective feedback moves are some types of hammers, as in my example. And in the literature, it is defined as any indication to the learners that their use of the target language is incorrect. This is here, the word any indication is very important because as teachers, we don't have to correct errors with our sentences all the time. Sometimes we use our minds just like, this, especially if you are teaching young learners or mm, just like this, okay? So any indication to the learners that their use of the target language is incorrect is called corrective feedback. And most of the time it follows an error and inform the learner that there is a problem in your statement. We sometimes do it by uttering a few words. We sometimes do it with nonverbal behaviors, okay, with our mimes and gestures. But whatever we do, it is a kind of indication to the learner's erroneous statement, okay? So we have some errors, some mistakes, erroneous utterance, let's say, and we have teacher's reaction to it, and it is called the corrective feedback. Corrective feedback is one of the most hot, I mean, most important topics. It's a really hot potato these days, okay? Especially in classroom interaction topics. And there are some current issues uh, scholars are talking about oral corrective feedback. The first question, the first discussion topic is whether the errors should be corrected or not. Tread or not to tread. That is the matter, okay? So should we correct errors or should we ignore them? This is an important question researchers and scholars are investigating these days. 
The second one is, when should errors be corrected? Should we interrupt our students and provide feedback immediately? Or should we wait till the end of the sentence or dialogue and then correct our students? Or should we wait till the end of the lesson or session and give a holistic feedback, okay? There are a lot of alternatives, but the researchers are still investigating the correct answer to that question. And another one, who should correct errors? As teachers, should we be the only person responsible for correcting errors? Or should we give some responsibility to our peers, to our students to correct their friends' mistakes, okay? These are some very important questions about oral corrective feedback, but probably the most important question about oral corrective feedback is how should we correct errors? How should we track errors in our classroom atmosphere? What is the best way to correct oral errors? Of course, we may have a lot of ideas. Any person who has some classroom teaching experience can utter a few words about the best way to correct students' mistakes, okay? There is not a clear-cut answer to that question, but there are some taxonomies in the literature that may guide us. And I would like to share one of those taxonomies that might help us to shape our feedback moves in a better way. The Corrective Feedback Taxonomy, published by Leister and Ranta in 1997, serves quite beneficially. And in this taxonomy, there are six types of corrective feedback modes. The first one is a recast, and I will share some examples about this corrective feedback moves. But to mention them briefly, in a recast, you directly provide the correct form and go on to your lesson without alerting students, okay? You just, when you hear an erroneous statement, you just correct and go on your lesson. This is called recast. The second one is explicit correction. In explicit correction, when you hear a mistake or an error, you correct it and make an explanation about it and then go on your lesson. What is the difference between recast? In recast, there is not an explanation. You correct and go on. In explicit correction, you correct and provide an explanation for that. The third one is clarification request, in which you ask your students to reformulate their utterance by saying, excuse me, sorry, can you please repeat your sentence? You uttered those questions and ask for a clarification request. The third one is metalinguistic feedback, in which you give some clues to your students so that they can correct their own mistake. When you hear an erroneous statement, you say, come on, when we want to say this, what do we use? Remember, there was something like this. Try to find it. You provide some clues for your students so that they can correct on their own. The fifth one is elicitation, in which when you hear an erroneous statement, you repeat the sentence, but stop just before the erroneous part and want your students to complete it, okay? I will show you the example 10 minutes later. And in repetition, 
you repeat the erroneous part with a rising tonation to make your students alert about the error they have done. Okay, these were briefly their definitions and let's have a look at the examples, please. This is a very typical recast. Okay, now to start with, what can we say about the man's habits? He always goes to bed early. Okay, good. Student five, he doesn't never drink alcohol. Yes, he never drinks alcohol. What else? You just correct the mistake and go on to your lesson. The bold sentence is a typical recast here. The second example is about the explicit correction. When I was at high school, I was used to wear, not used to, only used to, please be careful. I used to wear school uniform, but now I have casual clothes. And here you see the teacher corrects the mistake and makes some explanation. We can see that here our teacher is a little bit burned out because of the mistakes, most probably, okay? So uh, it would have been better if he or she <laughs> uh, did a better explanation, okay? In explicit correction, you make, you correct the error and make an explanation, okay? The clarification request, I'm sorry. Yes, it's going right. Yes, any other habit? He never eats chocolate. And the teacher asked Naomiyo, and what doesn't he eat? Chocolate. And again, the student makes the same mistake again. And then the teacher gives a recast, chocolate Osman, chocolate, and the students laugh, okay? And here, the first move, First corrective feedback move, Naomiyo, or what doesn't he eat, serves as a clarification request here. Okay? The teacher asks the question so that the student can reformulate his or her utterance. As an example for meta linguistic feedback, the students ask, is there any garage in the garden? Come on, we use any with plural nouns. It is singular, so, and the student said, is there a garage? And the teacher says, good. As you see, the teacher provides some tips, some clues here, so that the student can understand the mistake and corrects on his own, okay? And this is called as the metalinguistic feedback. And elicitation, that was a reported speech, I guess. Student one, he said me he didn't. And the teacher immediately interrupts. He, he said me. He, and for the second time, the teacher starts the sentence and stops just before the erroneous part to alert the student about the erroneous statement. And then in the second move, the student understands that there's a problem with the erroneous part and corrects the mistake on his own. And sometimes here, as says, as we see, the classroom corrects it and sometimes the peers do it, of course, after that. And the last type is repetition, in which, as I said before, the teacher repeats the erroneous part with a rising tonation, as you see in the sample dialogue. When I was a child, I was used to, was used to, I used to drink a lot of milk, but now I don't. And with 
the repetition of the erroneous part with a rising tonation help the learner understand that there is a problem with my sentence and then the student reformulates his or her sentence, okay? These were some sample dialogues to help you better understand the types of the oral corrective feedback modes. But to have a holistic view of all of them, in a recast, the teacher gives the correct form and go on. In explicit correction, the teacher gives the correct form plus an explanation. In a clarification request, you ask your students, sorry, again, please, can you repeat, please? Can you revise your sentence? And the students revise, reformulate their sentence. In repetition, the teacher repeats the erroneous part with a rising tonation. In metalinguistic feedback, as teachers, we give some clues to lead self-correction. And in illustration, we repeat the sentence, but stop just before the error so that the student can understand about the erroneous part he or she uttered. These are a general perspective to the types of feedback modes. Here, the most important thing that we need to be careful about, of course, the distinction between these categories. Here, Recast and explicit corrections are called as input providing corrective feedback types because as teachers, you provide the correct form. On the other hand, repetition, clarification request, elicitation, and metalinguistic feedback are called as output prompting feedback types because we provide something to our students and push them to correct their mistakes on their own. There is a big difference between these two. Input providing, as teachers, you provide the correct form, but in output prompting, you try to get the answers from your students, okay? This distinction is very important for us as teachers. And now, please, have another look in your papers, in your own corrective feedback moves. And please identify which type of corrective feedback move you are using, which one is you more dominant in your classrooms. You can both use the chat box and you can also unmute you, yourself and share your experiences with us. This is just a small scale reflective eye into your own practices. You can share your own experiences with us. Please write in the chat box so that we can learn and share our experiences. Yes, Aydan Ojam, please. Uh, Ojam, I wanted to say illustration, but then I realized that what I'm doing is more like I'm pretending that I'm checking, asking for the context, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, content, but in fact, I'm trying to model, correctly model uh, the uh, error. So this is a kind of a, an elicitation and metalinguistic correction. So it's like ch ch chocolate, so I, I would go like, chocolate? He never eats chocolate? Oh my God, how can someone never eat chocolate? Okay. Yeah, like <laughs> chocolate, 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 you know. Like A high level recasting maybe, okay. <laughs> Till, uh, till making the student alert about the erroneous statement, but you are providing the correct form again. I don't know. I mean, uh, is, is this recasting? 
may hocam it can okay. be a different type of uh, correcting feedback in this taxonomy maybe uh, okay uh, but uh, since you are providing the correct form again it could be called as a kind of recasting again yeah okay thank you thank you hocam for sharing some recasting metalinguistic feedback and repetition Beth Nojam says something like ch chocolate or chocolate. Okay, that can be kind of uh, clarification request may or meta linguistic feedback, Ojam. Because uh, this is definitely output prompting because you provide some alternatives to the students and uh, ask them to reformulate to find the correct form. That can be just in the middle, Beth Nojam. That, Okay, repeating the incorrect form might be again a little bit problematic. Yes, Alperen Ojam, you raise your hand. Hi, Ojam. I'm an Hello. ELT student. Uh, and as far as I observed, many of the teachers are using the recast model. Uh, yes. The reason might be it can be a time saving because the explicit correction or clarification requests uh, looks more, needs more time, I guess. I totally agree because we are going to talk about exactly about this topic a few minutes later. Okay, thank uh, you. You're perfect. That's such a good identification of the practices. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Marve Dombay Jojam from Anadolu University, recasting and repetition mostly. Thank you very much. And of course, there are a lot of practices, okay? All of us may have quite different answers here. It doesn't mean something is good or something is bad, okay? But we will be talking about another topic a few minutes later, which might make you question a little bit your practices more. We identified our corrective feedback moves. All of us here gave some answers to the examples, okay? And they identify what type of corrective feedback moves they employ in their classrooms. And here, now it's time to learn about their effectiveness. And here, while talking about these corrective feedback types, we will focus on three important concepts. The first one is uptake. What does uptake mean is that it is the degree your students understand that they made a mistake after your corrective feedback move. In other words, when you hear an erroneous statement and when you provide a corrective feedback move, the extent the degree your students understand your corrective feedback move is called the uptake. The second one, the second concept is repair. And it is the extent to which your students understand your corrective feedback and repair their sentences, reformulate their sentences correctly. If your feedback moves, whatever you do, a combination of all, a Voltron of all these feedback moves, it doesn't matter. If your corrective feedback move achieve these two, uptake and repair, that means it is a successful move. And the third one is distribution. It is the degree, the percentage of teachers preferring the corrective feedback type, okay? I will share some scientific results, some findings about these three concepts. The study conducted by Lysran Ranta and conducted by myself gave similarly the same results. As you see here, teachers mostly prefer to use recast in their 
fast rate. The percentage is 55, as you see. However, when we provide a recast, 30% of our students understand that they receive the feedback. And unfortunately, they never repair their sentences. In that sense, recast is found to be the least effective feedback move in language class range, but the most popular one by the teachers. This is something we need to question. On the other hand, look at elicitation, please. It is the least preferred feedback type by teachers, just 9%. But it is, it leads 100% to uptake. When you try to elicit your student's mistake, when you provide elicitation as a corrective feedback move, all your students understand that there's a problem with their sentences. And almost half of them finish with a correct repair. And similarly, unfortunately, repetition, although the percentage of uptake and repair is relatively high, repetition is the least preferred corrective feedback type in language clusters, as you see there. So when you look at this table, the summary table, recast is the most preferred form of feedback, but it is the least effective one. On the other hand, elicitation and repetition, they are the most effective feedback types, but it, it is the least preferred. There is a problem most of the time in our preferences. And as teachers, we have a tendency towards input providing feedback moves because an explicit correction, look at that. It's around 70%. So we tend to provide the correct form on our own. We don't let our students to correct their own mistakes. That means there is a lack of negotiation of forms in our classrooms. This is a very big problem in terms of classroom interaction. And as Alperen Oja mentioned a few minutes ago, why do we tend to use recast? I made a presentation about this in an international conference. That was another part of my study because the teachers think that it is practical. Recasting is practical and time saving. I have 40 minutes. I have to keep up with the curriculum. When I hear about mistakes, I have to correct them quickly and go on to my lesson. That is why I use the recast. But on the other hand, it is the least effective one, unfortunately. These are the perspectives from teachers. These are the teacher's practices. But what about the students? As teachers, we have our own philosophies. We have a lot of experiences. So we arrange our classroom practices based on these experiences and we decide in classroom atmosphere on our own. Although it is bad in the literature, it is called ineffective in the literature, we mostly have our own perspective. But what about our students? What do they feel? What do they think about our corrective feedback moves? First of all, I need to say that there is a paucity of research studies on this topic. If you are planning a research, if you are MA or a PhD student, or if you want to write another article about this topic, students' perspectives on oral corrective feedback, 
is open to such research findings. And the topic is really important for us because with the help of the findings, we can have the opportunity to understand the nature of feedback moves better. They're giving the feedback, but how do they receive it? What do they think about it? This is very important as well. And on this topic, we correct, we conducted another study in 2016, focusing on students' perspective with the help of stimulated recall interviews in which the students watched their own video recordings and they made some comments based on these video shots in which they were receiving feedback. We asked them, how did you feel? What did you understand about that? Okay, and the findings were enlightening for us. These are the students' perspective about the corrective feedback moves. For example, as a teacher, when you give a recast, the students think that, yes, it's quick, but it wasn't effective. One of the students, not just one, but many of the students uttered that it was just a repetition by the teacher. We didn't understand even there was a mistake. They don't understand that they made a mistake when we just recast and go on to our lesson. This is one of the key points of this session, my friends. When we recast our student, they just think that, ah, the teacher repeated my sentence. There is nothing problematic about my sentence, okay? For that reason, recasting might be a little bit risky for our students. For the explicit correction in which we both correct the sentence and make an explanation, the students think that they are clear and explanatory. They understand that there's a problem and they receive the explanation. So most of the time they were happy with the explicit correction. For the repetition, all of them thought that it was alerting. We understood that we made a mistake and we saw the mistake, okay? The repetition was alerting for the students. There was something interesting about the clarification request, which surprised me a lot while conducting the study. Students thought that the teacher's clarification request was ambiguous. Because when we say that, excuse me, can you repeat? Can you revise the sentence? The students think that the teacher didn't hear. The clarification request was not about the error, okay? The students told that, Pujam, we didn't understand why the teacher was asking for a clarification request. For that reason, they may think that clarification requests might be ambiguous. And in metalinguistic feedback, they thought that it was anxiety provoking. They say that when the teacher gives some clues and asks us to reformulate, we feel more and more actions. Remember, we do it like that. There was something like this, tell me. They, the students think that Bojan, we get on the spot. Everyone is looking at us. The teacher is giving a clue, but I'm getting more and more anxious and it's very hard for me to remember it. So they think that metalinguistic feedback, a little bit anxiety provoking for them. And the tips, the clues teachers provide might lead to some terminological confusion among students. And elicitation, that was save the best for the last. The students felt themselves quite comfortable in L station. They think that it was very effective. We detected our errors easily and we corrected on their own, on our own, okay? So in the eyes of the students, L station as a corrective feedback move was the best, of course, in our study. 
So let's have a look at your own practices again. What might your students feel and think about your feedback loops? Let's put yourself in your students. You can write from the chat box and you can turn on your voice and talk about your students' potential ideas. How do they feel in your classrooms about your feedback moves? Would you like to make some comments or share your experiences, if any? I, I'm just going to ask Gökhan Hocam something. You said elicitation is the best technique, most effective technique. And I totally agree with you. That's a mar uh, marvelous point. Mm -hmm. However, elicitation assumes that the student is not making an error, but he's making a mistake. Yes, exactly. So if I say, for example, uh, he said, hmm, he said, that means the student in his competence knows that say takes two. Exactly. So I'm a little bit confused here. Are we talking about errors? Because errors are at competence level and uh -huh. with elicitation, how are we gonna get the correct form? Because the student doesn't have the correct form. Exactly, Ojan. Or are I we would... talking? Um, okay, I'm so sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, Hojam. I had a very humble suggestion exactly about that point at the end, mm -hmm. because this is a very good point, and you are quite right about that. When we understand that the student cannot correct on his own, because in the first move, you provide an elicitation. He and the student cannot correct it, mm -hmm. again makes the same. And you again ask he, and there is not a correct answer again. And then as a teacher, we can turn our corrective feedback move into an input providing one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we try first output prompting, just like elicitation. And if the correct answer is not coming in the second or third move, now it's time for an explicit correction. This is going to be my very humble suggestion for that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. I was impatient. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ojan. But that was a perfect point. I mean, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Ojan. Shabna Ojan thinks that they may hate. <laughs> Ojan, I don't think so. Uh, I'm sure you are providing effective feedback types to your students, but of course, Sometimes our students might be cruel about our own practices, right? Sepide, please. Um, Hoja, first of all, it was a wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Hi, thank uh, you. Hojam, I have a private student. She mm -hmm. makes uh, a lot of mistakes and I try to use metalinguistic feedback mostly uh -huh. because it's a private session. I do not feel that she feels, uh, I don't feel like it's an anxiety provoking situation, okay. uh, but <laughs> I do not see the results. I mean, it's not useful for her. Really? I use repetition. I use a lot of techniques, but <laughs> it's not <laughs> useful actually. <laughs> not useful at all. Okay. I don't know what to do actually, but this is the situation with my student, unfortunately. Okay, you use a lot of techniques, but you yeah. do not get the results of it. Yes, yes, I jump. Okay. Verification request. I don't know. Explicit. A lot of explicit too. <laughs> okay, I see. Sometimes that is the situation, Stepida. Unfortunately, whatever you do, it doesn't matter what type of corrective feedback moves you provide. Sometimes you cannot find what you expect from your students. But at this point, if you cannot get what you want from your students, that is what my experience why I prefer to go on with explicit correction most of the time. Because when I, yes, when I uh, 
use output prompting types and cannot get what I want, I prefer to use explicit correction, at least to show my students that they made a mistake and this is the explanation so that they can understand and digest on their own, all right? Okay, Hojam, thank you so much. I Thanks. thank you for your sharing. Thank you, Hojam. Okay, any other experiences, if any? Okay, so I guess not. Our students might feel a lot of things, of course, about our practices. But when we turn ourselves, turn to ourselves and look at our own practices, I mean, there are a lot of answers you provide for these dialogues. There are a lot of alternative types of corrective feedback moves you provide. Some of them even are not in the taxonomy I mentioned, but all these answers provide something about your beliefs, which is every teacher has his or her own unique beliefs about correcting errors. And the answers you provide here, they are some kind of a demonstration about your beliefs regarding oral corrective feedback in your class. This session is not a real classroom atmosphere. And what you present here as ideas, experiences, they all refer to your beliefs about corrective feedback moves. But do we really reflect our beliefs into classroom atmosphere? We have a lot of things that are in our mind. I do that, I do this, I correct my students in that way. But do we really reflect our beliefs into the classroom atmosphere? Or in other words, do our beliefs and practices on oral corrective feedback really match or not? That is an important question. And on this topic, this corrective feedback journey produce another publication, another scientific publication with very interesting findings. The first thing about teachers' beliefs and real classroom practices is that teachers' beliefs and practices matched in the amount of feedback given. For example, if you think that, yes, I correct feedback, I provide feedback a lot. If you think that I correct all the mistakes or if you, uh, I ignore mistakes most of the time, this amount of feedback is reflected in the classroom. However, the types of feedback as teachers we have unfortunately differed from our beliefs and our classroom practices. The feedback types we believe and use in our classrooms, unfortunately, are different. The participants, teachers, they were some prep school lecturers, okay? While stating their beliefs, they highlighted that they used output prompting feedback types. And they were really self-confident most of the time. I give some clues to my students. I ask my students to self-correct themselves. I give my students some chances to correct their own mistakes. These were the beliefs. But when they started teaching in the classroom atmosphere, unfortunately, they tended to use more input providing corrective feedback types, such as recasting and explicit correction predominantly. That means in our beliefs, we may have some more effective types of corrective feedback, but we may not realize those beliefs in the real classroom atmosphere.
So that referred to a mismatch regarding the oral corrective feedback types. So we learned about some major feedback types on oral corrective feedback. And we learned that recasting was very common, but it was the least effective. And we also learned about some output prompting feedback types, which we think are more effective than the input providing feedback types. We also learned about students' perspectives on feedback types. Some of them were negative and some of them were positive. And we also learned that there might be some mismatch between the beliefs and practices of language teachers. For that reason, based on my previous teaching experience for about 10 years, and as a teacher educator and trainer for about five years, I have some very humble suggestions on oral corrective feedback. First of all, we need to be aware of our own practices. For that, please have a reflective eye in a micro level. Or you record an hour of your own session to see how you are correcting your students' mistakes. Be aware about your own classroom dynamics. Sometimes go and ask your students, what do you think about my corrections? What are your ideas about my feedback types? Get their ideas. Try to minimize input providing feedback types and use less input providing and try to increase the level of output prompting feedback types. To my own experience, if you ask then what is the best way, what is the most effective way based on my experiences, I can say that elicitation plus an explicit correction seems the right move. First, we need to give our students a chance to correct on their own. But if we see that the correct answer is not coming, then we can provide an explicit correction. And that type of a feedback worked best in my own specific teaching experience. And also as a teacher, we need to be consistent about our feedback moves. For example, that was a memory of mine. I was correcting all the third singular S while I was teaching prep school students. And one day I got really tired correcting that mistakes and ignored some of them. And at the end of the session, one of my our working students came to me, Ojam, you didn't correct two of the mistakes, three of the mistakes, why didn't you correct them? Huh. Then I thought as a teacher, I must be consistent about my feedback moves. Please take it as an important suggestion. And I also suggest you to be a stance and attitude towards a role corrected feedback. Let them say, Yokan Oja is obsessed with pronunciation mistakes. Yokan Oja never tolerates grammar mistakes. Yokonoja is mad about pragmatic problems. It's just like this, okay? So have a strict stance and attitude towards your corrective feedback moves. And please never forget, this is what I experienced in my teaching career. If provided at the right time and with the right manner, oral corrective feedback might be more effective than hours and hours of formal instruction. As a teacher, sometimes you try very hard to teach a topic, but they don't understand. But when you correct a mistake with the right manner, with the right time, it might be more effective than hours and hours of classroom teaching. And I would like to thank you very much. It was an honor for me to be with you in this fruitful session. And if you have any questions, I would appreciate them. And you can also write to me with email in a future time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gekhan Acham. It was a, a very informative session. And of course, uh, it gave us a chance to reflect on what we are doing. And hopefully uh, we will change our ways of correcting uh, mistakes or errors. So, 
there are some questions that I have noticed um, uh, in the chat box, uh -huh. but somehow uh, in your presentation, you have answered them. But I don't know whether the uh, people who have raised those questions would like to hear the answers again. So let me raise them. Defne Hoca has a question. Defne uh -huh. Hoca, would you like to ask your own question or do you want me to read it? The one uh, which is about uh, teachers not letting uh, mistakes go because they think that it is not, uh, it will give the students an incorrect impression that what they have produced uh, was correct. Does it make sense? Okay, Gökhan uh, Ocam, it says, uh, some teachers do not want to let mistakes go because they, they think if I let the student, if I let the mistake go, the student may think that what he has or they have produced is correct. And I don't want to do this. What do you think? As a teacher, I never let the mistakes go because <laughs> I, yes, I uh, agree in that sense because in a way it's just a recasting. Sometimes mm -hmm. it happens when you recast because the students do not understand that you corrected their mistake mm -hmm. and they think that the sentence they produce is true. Mm -hmm. There's nothing problematic. For that reason, we never let our students on their own. If mm -hmm. they make a mistake, if they produce an erroneous statement, we should definitely do something, give a reaction to their errors. This is what I believe. Uh, Shulina Rojam has made an excellent comment in the chat box. And Shulina Rojam, I totally agree with you. In fact, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, she says uh, she believes that type of correction the teacher uses depends highly on the educational philosophy the teacher yeah. adopts, definitely. For example, I wouldn't correct structural mistakes myself. Really? <laughs> I do not believe, I do not believe structural correctness. Mm -hmm. People who know me uh, know that I hate this grammar obsession because native speakers themselves do have several substandard uh, sub, uh, usages and they understand each other. Find a native speaker and on purpose, say the sentence, uh, she don't like milk. Look at his reaction, he will not react. That's normal, that's black English in fact. Uh, well, but this is my philosophy. Of course, if you work with future language teachers, you cannot tolerate these because these people are going to be models in their classrooms. So I do understand why Gökhan Ocham is so picky when it comes to errors. Mm -hmm. But for general language learners, I wouldn't even bother dealing with structural mistakes. Pronunciation, oh, that's another issue. That, I mean, no one will understand what you're saying. Vocabulary. Word choice, ooh, exactly. that is very, very, these are my personal opinions and I have the luxury of expressing my opinion because I'm the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jam, of course, that was a perfect comment by you. And I can clearly say I was a picky teacher in the past, but for now, as the years passed, I started to be focusing on more intelligibility as Shula Ujam uh, detects because uh, with the status of English in the world, the lingua franca, the importance of intelligibility, mm -hmm. I started to focus on a more communicative and comprehensible aspect of my students. But in the past, 
I was more obsessed with the errors. Maybe it depends on the experience you have most of the time. Hocam. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Saim Hocam is uh, raising a uh, hand. Please uh, unmute yourself and go ahead and raise your question, please. Uh, thank you very much, Aydan Hocam. And thank you very much, Kirkan Hocam, for this great presentation. Uh, actually, I have a question. You said that a dissertation explicit correction uh, seems to be the right move when you want to correct your students. Uh, do, uh, I, the question is, uh, should we um, have to correct uh, every error that the student makes? For example, if the aim is just to develop our students' fluency uh, and, and our focus is on the content uh, of what they are you know, bringing into the classroom, should we, in that moment, if the, even if the, the mistake or the error is crucial, I mean, should we intervene and correct? Because, in, you know, when the teacher uh, intervenes a lot, I think uh, maybe in that case, you know, the content part is uh, being sacrificed. And, you know, the, the students might feel that whatever I say, uh, as long as they are correct, doesn't, I mean, it's okay. Thank you very much. Saim Hocam, I thank you very much. I totally agree with your comments. And in the past, I experienced some similar things. The corrective feedback philosophy you adopt in your classroom will definitely change according to your classroom profile. For example, one of my classes, as I said before, I was uh, more picky and obsessed with errors in the past, but in one of my classes, my students discouraged a lot because of my interruptions, okay? <coughs> and they taught me that. Hojam, you interrupt us a lot. And for that type of students, I usually took some notes and I provided some holistic feedback at the end of the session, or I started to wait to the end of the activities, okay? So I adopted, employ some different type of timing choices for my students, but you're definitely right. If you feel that as a teacher, your students are discouraged with your interruptions, feedback interruptions, then you can change your feedback type definitely. Thank you very much. Uh, Gökhan Hocam, if it's okay with you, can you please uh, stop sharing your screen so of that we course, can Hocam. see all the participants? Exactly. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, Saim Hocam, I believe, uh, again, uh, that we need to make a, a distinction here between uh, teaching at, at an ELT department where you um, raise future language teachers and teaching at a, a, a general English classroom. They are two different things. When I work with teachers, future teachers, I'm like a butcher. Oh my God. Uh, I mean, my students hate me because I would not let them make especially pronunciation mistakes or vocabulary mistakes. Don't forget that most of the fossilized errors, most of them, are results of incorrect teaching. Unfortunately. At, in the past, at one time, we don't know when, one teacher modeled the word as hotel. No. So the students learned it as hotel. Now you need to work with that for two years to teach the student that it is hotel. <laughs> and that will cause you a nervous breakdown. <laughs> so <laughs> when you model, you have a huge responsibility. Exactly. Oh, there are so, there are so many funny videos on YouTube where uh, not Turkish teachers, but some other countries teaches or teaching pronunciation, English pronunciation, you should watch them. Oh my God, they are hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> they are hilarious. Um, okay, so are there any other questions or... Uh, 
Well, uh, earlier, John, one thing is when a student is um, trying to utter a sentence in an oral context, they are under great pressure. So they are so focused on what they are trying to say, they don't hear you, even if you correct them. So sometimes, you know, you stand by them, not to embarrass them, stand by them in the whisper, the correct form. They don't hear you. In fact, they give me a dirty look like this. Uh, why are you interrupting kind of look? And then continue talking. When you try to correct their mistake, when they are done, they are done. They don't care about the correction. They have finished their sentence. So they <laughs> sit down and say, Whoo, I have finished another sentence, you know? So they don't care. They don't listen. In my experience, I have been teaching English for such a long time. Unless you first raise awareness, they do not correct themselves. This is true in Turkish as well. Yeah. You can try it on your friends. If you catch them pronouncing a word incorrectly, try to correct them indirectly. You will see that they will not hear your correction and they will not correct themselves. So, yeah. Jam, uh, at this point, are, Jam, that's a very good point. Yes, Gökhan yes, Jam, you are totally right. And even for our pre-service teachers, when they come to the program in their first year in speaking classes, I struggle a lot to decrease their anxiety first. Yeah. So that they can feel more comfortable first and then utter a few words in yeah. front of their friends. So, uh, I mean, teaching speaking is uh, a very difficult, a challenging issue for teachers as well Definitely. in our context. Definitely. Yeah, Shulenur Jam, I totally agree with whatever you say. I mean, all of the comments that you make in the chat box, I agree with you. Uh, <laughs> Jam says, I used warrior states instead of combatant parties. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Jargon, right? This is what Enjoy. belongs to your own profession. A jargon, that's what's very, very dangerous when it comes to translation, yeah. especially. There are certain terms that you cannot translate, you know, word for word kind of <laughs> thing. You need to know that jargon in that profession. Uh, Jam says, Jam, can't we teach these types in a simple way to EFL learner first? Uh, Jam, I... I'm sorry, but I didn't understand what you're saying. You can, Ojam, can you understand the question? Ojam, I guess Bushro Ojam says to inform huh. our students about these feedback types. I ah. mean, if I, if I oh, okay. correct in that way, be aware of that. Is that right, Bushro Ojam? Yes, ah, exactly. Okay. Hmm. I, I haven't done it so far. I am doing it to my pre-service teachers mm -hmm. so that they can be aware of it. Mm -hmm. But I haven't done it to my EFL learners. Mm -hmm. That might be an innovative idea. You can try it and mm -hmm. you can see the results. That would work. It may work. You never know. Yeah. I mean, you know what? We do not have mathematical formulas. Yes, we are exactly. dealing with human beings. So you need to try out and see whether it uh -huh. works or not. Because something that may work for Gökhan Ojam may not yes. work for you or your yes. students, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, Gökhan Ojam, thank you very much. I'm going to uh, close the session officially okay. and then uh -huh. we will spare some time maybe to uh, chit chat. Thank you very much. I do appreciate this uh, has been a wonderful contribution to our talk series. And uh, I hope I will have you again with another topic 
to share awesome. with thank us. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for inviting Fee and me to this Zoom series. And it's an honor for me to be with you and thank with all you. these colleagues and share my experiences with them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And as usual, my dear colleagues, it's uh, a pleasure always to have you uh, with us. Uh, you have been supporting us for such a long time. And I hope you will continue doing that. Uh, so take very good care of yourselves. And uh, we are going to have a short break because of Bayram Hol holiday. But after that, uh, we will continue our sessions. <laughs>